9 Most Mysterious Locations on Earth Human history certainly holds its fair share of mysteries. Not all ancient civilizations were attentive bureaucrats like the ancient Romans, the people of ancient Rome were excellent at documentation, so we know a huge amount about them, their society, and their traditions. Unfortunately for historians, the story of certain societies, and their creations will always remain shrouded in an intriguing mystery, with no concrete answers in sight. A perfect example is the infamous Voynich Manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript supposedly originated in Italy. Carbon dating has put the handwritten manuscript around the early 1400s. For years, the nature of the Voynich Manuscript has puzzled all those who have come into contact with it. Why? The entire manuscript is written in a coded language, completely unlike any other language or form of writing that exists. No cryptographer has ever been able to decipher the code written in the book. Historians even enlisted the help of some expert code crackers, who worked during Wii, but none have ever had any luck. The manuscript itself is a few hundred pages, and most pages even include diagrams of strange plants that don't resemble any living species. Although many historians and cryptographers have suggested that the book could be nonsense, many maintain that the care and attention the unknown author must have put in during the manuscript's production suggests otherwise. It begs the question, why would someone spend hours and hours, plus a lot of money? Manuscripts were incredibly expensive items in the 15th century, producing something of no value to anyone. However, the number of mysterious monuments, and places that left traces still visible today greatly outweigh the number of entirely mysterious artifacts that have been discovered. Some of the monuments left behind by ancient peoples are so strange, and so well constructed, that they have left historians mystified. Aside from monuments, certain places on earth have an inescapable air of mystery about them, that remains unexplained to this day. If you're a bit of a conspiracy theorist and you're looking for a new adventure, the following eight locations could provide you with endlessly compelling mystery. 9. Groom Lake, Nevada Area 51. It's the most famous military institution in the world that doesn't officially exist. If it did, it would be found about 100 miles outside Las Vegas in Nevada's high desert, tucked between an Air Force base and an abandoned nuclear testing ground. Then again, maybe not, the U.S. government refuses to say. You can't drive anywhere close to it, and until recently, the airspace overhead was restricted all the way to outer space. Any mention of Area 51 gets redacted from official documents, even those that have been declassified for decades. It has become the holy grail for conspiracy theorists, with UFOlogists positing that the Pentagon reverse engineers flying saucers, and keeps extraterrestrial beings stored in freezers. Urban legend has it that Area 51 is connected by underground tunnels, and trains to other secret facilities around the country. In 2001, Katie Cork told Today Show audiences that 7% of Americans doubt the moon landing happened, that it was staged in the Nevada desert. Millions of X-Files fans believe the truth may be out there, but more likely it's concealed inside Area 51's strange love-esque hangars, buildings that, though confirmed by Google Earth, the government refuses to acknowledge. It wasn't always called Area 51, says Lavik, the physicist who developed stealth technology. His boss, legendary aircraft designer Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, called the place Paradise Ranch to entice men to leave their families, and rough it out in the Nevada desert in the name of science, and the fight against the evil empire. Test pilot Tony Lovier found the place by flying over it, says Lavik. It was a lake bed called Groom Lake, selected for testing, because it was flat and far from anything. It was kept secret because the CIA tested you to us there. We couldn't have told you any of this a year ago, Slater says. Now we can't tell it to you fast enough. That is because in 2007, the CIA began declassifying the 50-year-old Doc's Heart program. Today, there's a scramble for eyewitnesses to fill in the information gaps. Only a few of the original players are left. Two more of them join me and the Slayers for lunch, Barnes, 
formerly an Area 51 Special Projects engineer, with his wife, Doris, and Martin, one of those overseeing the Oxcart's specially mixed jet fuel. Regular fuel explodes at extreme height, temperature and speed, with his wife, Mary. Because the men were sworn to secrecy for so many decades, their wives still get a kick out of hearing the secret tales. So, what of those urban legends, the UFOs studied in secret, the underground tunnels connecting clandestine facilities? For decades, the men at Area 51 thought they'd take their secrets to the grave. At the height of the Cold War, they cultivated anonymity while pursuing some of the country's most covert projects. Conspiracy theories were left to popular imagination. But in talking with Collins, Lovick, Slater, Barnes and Martin, it is clear that much of the folklore was spun from threads of fact. As for the myths of reverse engineering of flying saucers, Barnes offers some insight. We did reverse engineer a lot of foreign technology, including the Soviet MiG fighter jet out at the area, even though the MiG wasn't shaped like a flying saucer. As for the underground tunnel talk, that, too, was born of truth. Barnes worked on a nuclear rocket program called Project Nerva, inside underground chambers at Jackass Flats, in Area 51's backyard. Three test cell facilities were connected by railroad, but everything else was underground, he says and the quintessential Area 51 conspiracy, that the Pentagon keeps captured alien spacecraft there, which they fly around in restricted airspace. Turns out that one's pretty easy to debunk. The shape of Oxcart was unprecedented, with its wide, disc-like fuselage designed to carry vast quantities of fuel. Commercial pilots cruising over Nevada at dusk would look up and see the bottom of Oxcart, was by at 2,000 plus miles per hour the aircraft's titanium body, moving as fast as a bullet, would reflect the sun's rays in a way that could make anyone think, UFO. In all, 2,850 Oxcart test flights were flown out of Area 51 while Slater was in charge. That's a lot of UFO sightings. Slater adds. Commercial pilots would report them to the fact and when they'd land in California they'd be met by FBI agents who'd make them sign non-disclosure forms. But not everyone kept quiet, hence the birth of Area 51's UFO lore. The sightings incited uproar in Nevada and the surrounding areas, and forced the Air Force to open Project Blue Book to log each claim. Since only a few Air Force officials were cleared for Oxcart, even though it was a joint CIA-USAF project, Many UFO sightings raised internal military alarms. Some generals believed the Russians might be sending stealth craft over American skies to incite paranoia, and create widespread panic of alien invasion. Today, Blue Book findings are housed in 37 cubic feet of case files at the National Archives, 74,000 pages of reports. A keyword search brings up no mention of the top-secret Oxcart or Area 51. Project Blue Book was shut down in 1969, more than a year after Oxcart was retired. But what continues at America's most clandestine military facility could take another 40 years to disclose. 8. New Grange. New Grange has been dated to about 3200 BC, more broadly 3300 to 2900 BC, during the Neolithic period. It is not known for whom the tomb was built but it was clearly the burial place of great tribal leaders. The kings were cremated and their ashes were interred here. Scholars are generally agreed that New Grange was used not only as a tomb, but for ceremonial and religious rites. Legend says the mound was dedicated to Daga, the sun god of pre-Christian Ireland, and later became the burial places of the pagan kings of Tara. Veneration of the sun is certainly suggested by the many carvings of sun symbols on New Grange stones, and the magnificent spectacle of sunrise on the winter solstice, see astronomical alignment, below. The mound subsided not long after completion, burying the curbstones and collapsing the quartz facade, but New Grange remained an important religious center until the early Bronze Age. A cursus oriented north-south about 100 meters east of the tomb was built in the later Neolithic age, followed a little while later by a hinge to the southeast. 
The standing stones around the mound were probably erected after this. Unfortunately, the tomb has been empty of its original contents since 861 AD, when it was plundered by Viking raiders. More recently, there was a period of over 100 years during which the tomb was discovered but unprotected, it thus suffered further damage from treasure hunters and looters. The many mysteries of New Grange, who built it? What were its purposes? What do the spirals mean? Have prompted a variety of theories about its origin and purpose. New Grange is especially revered by New Age adherents, who believe it to be a place of great energy and mystical power. The spirals are interpreted as symbols of the journey to the next world, and the tomb is thought to be a solar temple of a prehistoric race of supernatural people. Based on its shape, it has also been suggested that New Grange is a model of a flying saucer. The New Grange tomb rises from the meadow in an egg-shaped mound called a tumulus. It is 250 feet across and 40 feet high, and covers an entire acre. The exterior of the mound is decorated with 97 large curbstones, or curbstones in the American spelling, that are carved with beautiful and intriguing spiral designs. Scholars think these stones were recycled from an earlier burial place. Three of the curbstones are especially striking, the threshold stone or entrance stone, curbstone 52, located diametrically opposite the entrance on the northwest side and curbstone 67 on the northeast side. The threshold stone is elaborately carved with spirals, concentric circles and diamond shapes. Their meaning is not known but theories are plentiful. Some hold that the three main spirals represent the tombs of New Grange, Noth and Douth, with the wavy line below depicting the river Boyne. Others think the three spirals represent life, death and eternity. The facade around the perimeter is made of sparkling white quartz brought from 50 miles away, punctuated by egg-shaped granite stones. The facade has been shaped by archaeologists to allow for visitor access. The dark stones that curve inwards were deliberately chosen to show they are not an original feature of the tomb. Originally, the white facade continued over the entrance stone, with a narrow recess leading to the roof box and entrance. The roof box allows sunlight and on the winter solstice, see below. The mound itself is made of 200,000 tons of stone brought from 75 miles away, which were then covered with several yards of soil. The boulders were placed with amazing precision that makes the structure watertight, just how this was done remains a mystery. Inside, a 60-foot-long narrow passage leads into a dome chamber, almost 20 feet high with three side alcoves for burials. The inner room is made of layered stones forming a corbelled roof or beehive vault, which has held the weight of the mound above without mortar, and without leaking water for over 6,000 years. The side alcoves contain mysterious stone basins, whose purpose is not known. They may have been used for washing bodies, receiving funerary offerings, depositing the ashes of cremated remains, or for priestly rituals. The most striking aspect of the New Grange tomb is its precise astronomical alignment, which allows for a truly spectacular phenomenon at sunrise on the winter solstice, December 19th to 23rd, especially the 21st. On this day, the shortest of the year, a shaft of sunlight enters through a large opening above the entrance, called the roof box, and pierces the inner passageway. The sunbeam touches a stone basin at the end of the passageway, and lights up a series of spiral carvings inside the chamber, whose meaning is unknown. The event lasts about 17 minutes. The guided tour of the tomb includes an impressive reenactment of this effect, and a lucky few each year also experience the real thing. You can enter your name in a lottery for a chance to join. Twelve standing stones still survive in a circle around the tomb, of which there may have originally been as many as 35. Archaeologists have not been able to determine their date with certainty, but at least one of the standing stones has been shown to post-date the henge south of the mound, which was made in the later Neolithic period. None of these stones are decorated with carvings. Now marked by modern wooden posts, the henge at Nugarange was built several centuries after the main passage tomb. The pit and post circle measures about 394 feet 120 meters, in diameter 
and evidence of occupation was found inside it, including almost 800 pieces of flint and pottery from the grooved ware and beaker periods. Some of the pits contained animal bones, which were probably votive offerings. Nobody knows how they managed to carry the giant stones and construct the building. The exact purpose of Nuga Range, too, remains a mystery. 7. The Roanoke Colony. In 1587, Englishman John White led more than 100 men, women and children in the first attempt to found a permanent English colony in the New World. The group settled on Roanoke Island, one of a chain of barrier islands now known as the Outer Banks, off the coast of North Carolina. Later that year, White headed back to England to bring more supplies, but England's naval war with Spain would delay his return for nearly three years. When he finally arrived on Roanoke Island, on August 18, 1590, White found the colony abandoned and looted, with no trace of the settlers. Only two clues remained, the word Croatoan had been carved on a post and the letters CRO scratched into a tree trunk. Now, two separate teams of archaeologists say they have uncovered new evidence suggesting what may have happened to the inhabitants of the famed lost colony. When John White, appointed by Sir Walter Raleigh as governor of Roanoke Colony, returned to England for more supplies in late 1587, he left behind his wife his daughter and his infant granddaughter, Virginia Dare, the first child born in the New World to English parents, among the other settlers. Upon White's return in 1590, he found no trace of his family or the other inhabitants of the abandoned colony. Over the centuries to come, archaeologists, historians and explorers would delve into the mystery of the lost colony of Roanoke, all failing to find definitive answers. Based on the scant clues left behind, some speculated that Native Americans attacked and killed the English colonists. Croatoan was the name of an island south of Roanoke, now Hatteras Island, which at the time was home to a Native American tribe of the same name. Alternatively, they might have tried to sail back to England on their own and been lost at sea, or been killed by hostile Spaniards who came north from their own settlements in Florida. One enduring theory was that the settlers might have been absorbed into friendly Native American tribes, perhaps after moving further inland into what is now North Carolina. Now, two independent teams have found archaeological remains suggesting that at least some of the Roanoke colonists might have survived, and split into two groups, each of which assimilated itself into a different Native American community. One team is excavating a site near Cape Creek on Hatteras Island, around 50 miles 80 kilometers, southeast of the Roanoke Island settlement, while the other is based on the mainland about 50 miles, to the northwest of the Roanoke site. Cape Creek, located in a live oak forest near Pamlico Sound, was the site of a major Croatoan town center and trading hub. In 1998, archaeologists from East Carolina University stumbled upon a unique find from early British America a 10-carat gold signet ring engraved with a lion or horse, believed to date to the 16th century. The ring's discovery prompted later excavations at the site led by Mark Horton, an archaeologist at Britain's Bristol University, who has been directing volunteers with the Croatoan Archaeological Society in annual digs since 2009. Recently, Horton's team found a small piece of slate that seems to have been used as a writing tablet and part of the hilt of an iron rapier, a light sword similar to those used in England in the late 16th century, along with other artifacts of European and Native American origin. The slate, a smaller version of a similar one found at Jamestown, bears a small letter M still barely visible in one corner, it was found alongside a lead pencil. In addition to these intriguing objects, the Cape Creek site yielded an iron bar, and a large copper ingot or block, both found buried in layers of earth that appear to date to the late 1500s. Native Americans lacked such metallurgical technology, so they are believed to be European in origin. Horton told National Geographic that some of the artifacts his team found are trade items, but it appears that others may well have belonged to the Roanoke colonists themselves, the evidence is that they assimilated with the Native Americans but kept their goods. 
A watercolor map drawn by none other than John White inspired the search at Site X, as it's known, located on Albemarle Sound near Edenton, North Carolina, some 50 miles inland. Known as La Virginia Pars, the map shows the east coast of North America from Chesapeake Bay to Cape Lookout. It is housed at the British Museum as part of its permanent collection. White began drawing the map in 1585, two years before he became governor. In 2012, researchers using X-ray spectroscopy and other imaging techniques spotted a tiny four-pointed star, colored red and blue, concealed under a patch of paper that White used to make corrections to his map. It was thought to mark the location of a site some 50 miles inland, which White alluded to in testimony given after his attempted return to the colony. If such a site did exist, the theory went, it would have been a reasonable destination for the displaced Roanoke settlers. According to archaeologist Nicholas Luckety of the First Colony Foundation, which is conducting the excavations at Site X, the group has found shards of pottery that they claim may have been used by Roanoke settlers after they left the colony. Located nearby is a site that archaeologists believe might have been a small Native American town, Metacom. After the Roanoke colony met its end, English settlers eventually came south from Virginia into North Carolina. But the first recorded settler in the area did not arrive until about 1655. But the recently uncovered pottery is in a style called border ware, which is typical of the pottery dug up on Roanoke Island, as well as at Jamestown, but was no longer imported to the New World after the early 17th century when the Virginia Company dissolved. In addition to the border ware pottery, archaeologists at Cytex discovered various other items, including a food storage jar known as a baluster, pieces of early gun flintlocks, a metal hook of the sort used to stretch animal hides or tents in an aglet, a small copper tube used to secure wool fibers, before the advent of the hook and die in the 17th century. Based on his team's findings, Luckety thinks the Roanoke colonists may have moved inland to live, with Native American allies sometime after White left, and these artifacts might have been among their belongings. As reported in the New York Times, the First Colony Foundation will reveal more about its findings, and theory this week in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Though the newly announced discoveries don't solve this lingering historical mystery, they do point away from Roanoke Island itself where researchers have failed to come up with evidence pointing to the lost colony's fate. Archaeologists on both teams are hoping that a detailed study of their new finds will yield more clues, and, of course, that more evidence remains, waiting to be discovered, in the endless layers of dirt that surround them. 6. Sailing Stones California's remote, beautiful, and foreboding Death Valley has held a mystery for almost a century. It has stones that seem to move on their own, when no one is looking. It happens at Racetrack Playa, a dry lake bed known for its sailing stones. This effect occurs at a few other places as well, though Death Valley is the most famous spot. Thanks to some high-tech sleuthing, the mystery may have been solved, at least partly. In their book Mysteries of the World, Unexplained Wonders and Mysterious Phenomena, Herbert Jensmer and Ulrich Helen Brand state that the perfectly flat, dry ground is scoured and scraped with paths that suggest these boulders are being moved along the ground. There is no indication of how this movement could have been brought about by outside forces, and no stone has ever been observed actually making its way across the ground. Not all of the stones in Death Valley move. Those that do only move every two to three years and they don't all move at the same time or in the same direction. In fact, some seem to have made abrupt 90-degree turns, judging from the tracks, which range from tens of feet to hundreds of feet long. Most of the stones are not huge boulders, but instead range from about 6 to 18 inches, 15 to 45 centimeters, in diameter. Several theories have been proposed to explain this curious phenomenon, including some sort of localized, unknown magnetic effect. This theory has been discounted for a variety of reasons including that many of the stones, do not contain significant amounts of magnetic elements such as iron, 
and that the stones should gradually assemble in one place, which they don't. Some have suggested that the strong winds that blow through the area might move the rocks after the lake bed has become slick. The most likely solution to the mystery involves a combination of wind, temperature and water. Although racetrack Playa is a dry lake bed, it is not always dry, in fact, water collects on the surface after rainfall, or when snow from surrounding peaks melts. Brian Dunning, a California researcher who discussed this mystery on his Skeptoid podcast, notes that when water is present and the temperature falls below freezing, as it sometimes does, a thin sheet of ice is created, solid ice, moving with the surface of the lake and with the inertia of a whole surrounding ice sheet, would have no trouble pushing a rock along the slick muddy floor. As the wind shifts and the flow ebbs, these ice flows drag the rocks across the slippery mud surface in zigzagging paths, even moving heavy rocks and sometimes dragging some but washing past others nearby. NASA researcher Ralph Lawrence became intrigued by the enigmatic stones, while studying Death Valley weather conditions. He developed a tabletop experiment to show how the rocks might glide across the surface of the lake a bit. I took a small rock and put it in a piece of Tupperware, and filled it with water so there was an inch of water with a bit of the rock sticking out," Lawrence told Smithsonian.com. After putting the container in the freezer, Lawrence ended up with a small slab of ice with a rock embedded in it. By placing the ice-bound rock in a large tray of water with sand at the bottom, all he had to do was gently blow on the rock to get it to move across the water. And as the ice-embedded rock moved, it scraped a trail in the sand at the tray's bottom. Though such explanations are plausible, they were very difficult to prove since no one had actually seen or recorded the stone's movements. Understandably, no one has volunteered to spend every minute of their lives, day and night for several years, enduring temperatures that can reach well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 C, hoping to see a stone move. Furthermore, Racetrack Playa is almost 3 miles long and over a mile wide, 4.8 by 1.6 kilometers. A person of course can't be everywhere at once, and would have to pick one or two rocks too closely, and continually monitor just in case they happen to suddenly move. And can you imagine the frustration if someone spent two years watching a non-moving rock, only to later learn that several other rocks on another part of the lake of bed had moved while they weren't watching? Fortunately, the technology exists to investigate the mystery remotely. In 2013, a team of scientists using rocks with motion-activated GPS units, and time-lapse photography captured the first video footage of the stones creeping across the desert floor. It turns out that jagged plates of thin ice, resembling panels of broken glass, bulldoze the rocks across the flooded playa. Driven by gentle winds, the rocks seem to hydroplane atop the fluffy, wet mud. The scientists revealed their findings in the August 27th issue of the journal Plos One. The mystery has not been solved completely, however. The video shows how smaller rocks move, but no one has ever seen the gigantic playa boulders budge an inch. Another process may be at work on the biggest rocks, according to Jim Norris, an engineer and member of the team. I know there are people who like the mystery of it, and will probably be somewhat disappointed that we've solved it," Norris said. It's a fascinating process, and in many ways I hope that there's more to be discovered. Never say never. 5. The Yanaguni Monument When scuba diving instructor Kihachiro Airate plunged into the water, off the coast, of the Japanese island of Yanaguni in 1986, he discovered an incredible sight. Six meters below the surface lay a series of monoliths, that he described as appearing to be terraced into the side of a mountain. The huge rectangular formations had strikingly perfect 90-degree angles, including straight walls, steps and columns. Over the following years experts descended upon the site, in a bid to determine whether the structure was natural or man-made. Yet to this day, it remains a great unsolved mystery. Initially it was proposed that the Yanaguni monument was built, when the area was above sea level some 10,000 years ago. So could Japan's Atlantis be a remnant of a preglacial civilization that was eventually inundated? 
or could it be the result of an earthquake, putting it at 2,000 to 3,000 years old? Experts disagree. As the structure was mapped out over the following years, more details came to light. Divers found what appeared to be a huge arch, as well as temples, carvings, paved streets and a large pyramid-like structure measuring 76 meters long at its base. Masaaki Kimura, a marine geologist at the University of the Rukias in Japan, who has dived at the site more than 100 times, over the past 20 years to measure its formations, is convinced they are the remains of a city that sunk due to seismic events. He had identified 10 structures off Yanaguni, and a further 5 related structures off the main island of Okinawa, with the ruins spanning an area of 300 meters x 150 meters. I think it's very difficult to explain away their origin as being purely natural, because of the vast amount of evidence of man's influence on the structures, he said. The largest structure looks like a complicated, monolithic, stepped pyramid that rises from a depth of 25 meters. The characters and animal monuments in the water, which I have been able to partially recover in my laboratory, suggest the culture comes from the Asian continent. One example I have described as an underwater sphinx resembles a Chinese or ancient Okinawan king. Other evidence that experts believe confirms its man-made include two round holes, and a row of straight, smaller holes, which are interpreted as an attempt to split off a section of the rock. However, the Morian Institute, an archaeological non-profit research group, conducted an expedition there in 1997 led by Dr. Robert M. Schock, a professor of science and mathematics from Boston University. Dr. Schock, who has also conducted field research at sites in Pakistan, Egypt and the Canadian High Arctic, argues that it's primarily a natural rock formation. I'm not convinced that any of the major features, or structures are man-made steps or terraces, but that they're all natural," he wrote in his book Voices of the Rocks. It's basic geology and classic stratigraphy for sandstones, which tend to break along plains and give you these very straight edges, particularly in an area with lots of faults and tectonic activity. Apostrophe dot 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 the structure is, as far as I could determine, composed entirely of solid living bedrock. No part of the monument is constructed of separate blocks of rock that have been placed into position. This is an important point, for carved and arranged rock blocks would definitively indicate a man-made origin for the structure, yet I could find no such evidence. He said it was possible that humans had since made modifications to the formations. We should also consider the possibility that the Yanaguni monument is fundamentally a natural structure that was used, enhanced and modified by humans in ancient times. Patrick D. Nunn, professor of oceanic geoscience at the University of the South Pacific, has studied these structures extensively and also believed they were natural, saying, there seems no reason to suppose that they are artificial. This was backed up by archaeologist Richard J. Pearson, who argued that while stone tools and small camps were found at Yanaguni possibly from the 2500 BCE, they were small communities who were not likely to have had extra energy for building stone monuments. Will we ever know for sure? 4. Stonehenge Stonehenge is a massive stone monument located on a chalky plain north of the modern-day city of Salisbury, England. Research shows that the site has continuously evolved over a period of about 10,000 years. The structure that we call Stonehenge was built between roughly 5,000, and 4,000 years ago and that forms just one part of a larger, and highly complex, sacred landscape. The biggest of Stonehenge's stones, known as sarsens, are up to 30 feet, 9 meters, tall and weigh 25 tons, 22.6 metric tons, on average. It is widely believed that they were brought from Marlborough Downs, a distance of 20 miles, 32 kilometers, to the north. Smaller stones, referred to as bluestones, they have a bluish tinge when wet or freshly broken, weigh up to 4 tons and come from several different sites in western Wales, having been transported as far as 140 miles, 225 kilometers. It's unknown how people in antiquity moved them that far. Scientists have raised the possibility that, 
During the last Ice Age glaciers carried these blue stones closer to the Stonehenge area, and the monuments makers didn't have to move them all the way from Wales. Water transport through raft is another idea that has been proposed, but researchers now question whether this method was viable. The story of how Stonehenge, and its sacred landscape, was built is evolving rapidly as new archaeological discoveries are made. The IBM Visual and Spatial Technology Center at the University of Birmingham is using an array of technologies, including ground-penetrating radar and magnetometers, to map Stonehenge and its environs. The project has produced an enormous amount of data, which scientists haven't fully analyzed. In addition other research projects have also made recent finds, such as evidence for widespread prehistoric hunting and what may be a new road. When the new discoveries are combined with older finds, it shows that Stonehenge was just one part of a complex and constantly changing sacred landscape. From what scientists can tell, Salisbury Plain was considered to be a sacred area long before Stonehenge itself was constructed. As early as 10,500 years ago, three large pine posts, which were totem poles of sorts, were erected at the site. Hunting played an important role in the area. Recently researchers uncovered roughly 350 animal bones, and 12,500 flint tools or fragments, just a mile away from Stonehenge, the finds dating from the 7500 BC to 4700 BC the presence of abundant game may have led people to consider the area sacred. Recently researchers have also discovered a massive wooden building, which may have been used for burial rituals. Also. Dozens of burial mounds have been discovered near Stonehenge indicating that hundreds, if not thousands, of people were buried there in ancient times. At least 17 shrines, some in the shape of a circle, have also been discovered near Stonehenge. As time went on the landscape continued to change. Around 5,500 years ago, two earthworks known as Cursus monuments were erected, the longest of which ran for 1.8 miles, 3 kilometers. More construction occurred around 5,000 years ago, with post holes indicating that either bluestones, or upright timber posts were propped up on the site. Then, around 4,600 years ago, a double circle made using dozens of bluestones was created at the site. By 4,400 years ago, Stonehenge had changed again, having a series of sarsen stones erected in the shape of a horseshoe with every pair of these huge stones having a stone lintel connecting them. In turn, a ring of sarsens surrounded this horseshoe, their tops connecting to each other, giving the appearance of a giant interconnected stone circle surrounding the horseshoe. By 4,300 years ago, Stonehenge had been expanded to include the addition of two blue stone rings, one inside the horseshoe and another between the horseshoe, and the outer layer of interconnected sarsen stones. Construction at Stonehenge slowed down around 4,000 years ago. As time went on the monument fell into neglect and disuse, some of its stones fell over while others were taken away. Recently, archaeologists found an interesting connection, between the earlier Cursus monuments and the later Stonehenge. They found that the longest Cursus monument had two pits, one on the east and one on the west. These pits, in turn, align with Stonehenge's heel stone and a processional avenue. Suddenly, you've got a link between, the long Cursus pit, and Stonehenge through two massive pits, which appear to be aligned on the sunrise, and sunset on the midsummer solstice, said University of Birmingham archaeologist Vincent Gaffney, who is leading the project to map Stonehenge and its environs. While there have been many theories as to why Stonehenge was constructed, Recent discoveries indicate that Stonehenge's landscape was a sacred area, one that underwent constant change. It's part of a much more complex landscape with processional, and ritual activities that go around it, Gaffney told Live Science, noting that people may have traveled considerable distances to come to Stonehenge. One new theory about Stonehenge, released in 2012 by members of the Stonehenge Riverside Project is that Stonehenge marks the unification of Britain, a point when people across the island worked together and used a similar style of houses, pottery and other items. 
It would explain why they were able to bring bluestones all the way from West Wales, and how the labor and resources for the construction were marshaled. In a news release, Professor Mike Parker Pearson of the University of Sheffield said that, this was very different to the regionalism of previous centuries. Stonehenge itself was a massive undertaking, requiring the labor of thousands to move stones, from as far away as West Wales, shaping them and erecting them. Just the work itself, requiring everyone literally to pull together, would have been an act of unification. 3. The Great Pyramid of Giza Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza could contain two previously unknown cavities. Experts confirmed the existence of the mysterious cavities on Saturday, after scanning the millennia-old monument with radiography equipment. It follows an announcement by the Antiquities Ministry on Thursday that, two anomalies were found in the pyramid built 4,500 years ago under King Khufu. They said they were conducting further tests to determine their function, nature and size. At 146 meters, 480 feet, tall, the Great Pyramid of Giza, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu, named after the son of Pharaoh Snefru, is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It has three known chambers, and like other pyramids in Egypt was intended as a pharaoh's tomb. We are now able to confirm the existence of a void hidden behind the north face, that could have the form of at least one corridor going inside the Great Pyramid, scientists from Operation Scan Pyramid said in a statement. Another cavity was discovered on the pyramid's northeast flank, said the researchers who are using radiography and 3D reconstruction for their study. Such void is shaped like a corridor and could go up inside the pyramid, Mehdi Tabai, founder of the Paris-based Heritage Innovation Preservation Institute, told Seeker. He said that currently no link can be made between the two cavities. Operation Scan Pyramids began in October last year to search for hidden rooms inside Khufu, and its neighbor Kafr and Giza, as well as the Bent and Red Pyramids in Dashur, all south of Cairo. The project applies a mix of infrared thermography, muon radiography imaging and 3D reconstruction, all of which the researchers say are non-invasive and non-destructive techniques. Muons are similar to X-rays which can penetrate the body and allow bone imaging, and can go through hundreds of meters of stone before being absorbed, scan pyramids explained in a statement. Judiciously placed detectors, for example inside a pyramid, below a potential, unknown chamber, can then record particle tracks and discern cavities from denser regions. In May, Archaeologists revealed 3D scans taken using muons of the 4,500-year-old Bent Pyramid at the Royal Necropolis of Dasher. These scans revealed the pyramid's internal structure, clearly showing a second chamber around 60 feet above a lower chamber. For the first time ever, the internal structure of a pyramid was revealed with muon particles, Mehdi Tabai co-director of the Scan Pyramids and president of the Heritage Innovation Preservation Institute told Discovery in May. Some had suggested Pharaoh Sneferu was buried inside the pyramid in a hidden chamber, but the latest scans have ruled out that possibility. For more than 4,500 years, Egypt's pyramids have kept their secrets hidden deep within the labyrinth of passages, and chambers that lie inside their towering stone structures. But the long-running row over whether the Great Pyramid of Giza is hiding a network, of previously undiscovered tunnels behind its stone walls has now been answered. The researchers confirmed the find using cosmic particles known as muons to scan the Great Pyramid of Giza. They used the scans to create maps to reveal the internal structure of the 479 feet, 146 meters, high pyramid. Last year thermal scanning identified a major anomaly in the Great Pyramid, the largest and oldest of the pyramids at Giza and one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Those scans identified three adjacent stones at its base, which registered higher temperatures than others. This led to theories that they may be hiding a secret chamber that had yet to be discovered. A team of experts then set up the Scan Pyramids project to use muons tiny subatomic particle that are typically produced by cosmic rays smash into atoms on Earth, to peer through the pyramid's huge stone blocks, some of which weighed up to 15 tons. 
Dr. Hawass has in the past been skeptical of the usefulness of conducting such scans. He recently clashed publicly with British Egyptologists over their theory, that a secret burial chamber may be hidden behind the walls of Tutankhamun's tomb in his pyramid in the Valley of the Kings. But Egyptologists have since disagreed on whether, there is a secret chamber in the tomb and further analysis is expected too. The Bermuda Triangle The Bermuda Triangle is a part of the world that has long been the subject of debate, and since the early 20th century has permeated the public consciousness. The Bermuda Triangle is a triangle of water located in the Atlantic Ocean, between Florida, Puerto Rico and Bermuda itself. The triangle of water is allegedly cursed, due to reports of many sea vessels and aircraft meeting their doom within the triangle. Reports range from unexplained disappearances of aircraft flying over the triangle to ships, which have emerged from the triangle with no crewmen left on board. Explanations for these mysterious happenings have ranged from the supernatural to the scientific, some blame aliens, others blame magnetic fields and wormholes in time. However, recent researchers suggest that many of the mysterious disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle have been greatly exaggerated or even fabricated raising questions as to whether or not there's really anything strange happening around the triangle at all. Of course, reports of anomalies occurring within the Bermuda Triangle continue to emerge, so the mystery persists. Among other facts about Bermuda Triangle, a highly notable fact is that over 8,000 people have lost their lives, or have just vanished over the years due to this mystery of Bermuda Triangle. Some of the top ship disappearance incidences are, Mary Celeste. Possibly one of the most mysterious stories of Bermuda Triangle, this ship is a tale of its own. Discovered on 4th of December, 1872 with everything right in the place except for the entire crew, the ship was found stranded in the sea. Studies of the ship clearly rule out a pirate attack since everything on this ship, including the barrels of alcohol it was transporting, and the valuable belongings of the crew were intact. Lots of speculation ensued that cover everything, from pirate attack to sea quakes to even crew losing its sanity due to some infected food material have been proposed. However, as much as these speculations seem reasonable, they clearly don't fit. After all, why would a perfectly skilled crew on a good weather day, with their ship entirely uncompromised abandon it and then never surface again? It's an unsolved mystery. Ellen Austin it is an unnerving triangle mystery associated with the Ellen Austin, a ship bound for New York. In 1881, this white oak schooner was on her way to New York, when she stumbled upon a derelict that seemed fine minus any crew. In order to tow it back with her, she placed a prize crew on the ship, set to sail together. However, a squall separated path of the two ships following which the derelict vanished. On seeing this, Ellen Austin reportedly sailed back to London. However, reports suggest that the derelict was once more spotted, but this time he had a separate crew than the prize crew placed on it by Ellen Austin. The disappearance of the ship, her reappearance and the absence of the prize crew is an intriguing story. It is more like a secret of Bermuda Triangle, one that has seemingly no chances of being unraveled anytime soon. USS Cyclops a fascinating triangle mystery in true sense, USS Cyclops is the largest human loss reported by U.S. Coast Guard on a non-combat ship. In March 1918, this massive ship set out to sail through the Bermuda region carrying about 309 crew members. Setting off on a fairly good day, the first and the only message sent by this ship indicated no sort of troubles. However, the ship was never heard from again. An entire search of the area was put into action but nothing was ever found. No remains of the ship or any of the more than 300 crew members aboard have ever been found. This ship continues to remain a mystery considering none of the other possible reasons for its disappearance seems to fit completely. Carol A. Deering In 1921, an investigation team was set from Barbados to look into the five-masted schooner Carol A. Deering believed to be involved in rum running. However, when the investigation team reached this ship, what they found was a deserted ship with all crew members gone along with some ship documents. 
The disappearance of this ship along with a few others, that happened during the same time period has been a valuable information on Bermuda Triangle, but nothing that brings anyone any closer to solving this mystery. Reports suggest that as many as nine vessels disappeared during this period, from the same region, none of which was ever heard from again. Witchcraft. On December 22, 1967, a cabin cruiser named Witchcraft left from Miami with her captain Dan Barak. Few minutes into the sailing and a call was received from the captain stating, that his ship had hit something but there was no substantial damage. Indicating help to be towed to the shore, the Coast Guard set off immediately reaching Witchcraft in as many as 19 minutes alone but to nothing. The area indicated as location of the ship was completely deserted, with no signs of any ship having been stranded or even present there previously. What's most intriguing about this story is that this particular cruiser was virtually unsinkable, not to mention that numerous life-saving devices present aboard including life jackets, lifeboats, flares, distress signal devices etc. None of them were used and the ship was gone. Nothing of this ship has been found till this day. The ship is gone and what remains is only the speculation that can be done now. Do you have any other stories to be associated with the Bermuda Triangle mystery? Let us know in the comments. 1. Easter Island. Easter Island covers roughly 64 square miles in the South Pacific Ocean, and is located some 2,300 miles from Chile's west coast, and 2,500 miles east of Tahiti. Known as Rapa Nui to its earliest inhabitants, the island was christened Paisaland, or Easter Island, by Dutch explorers in honor of the day of their arrival in 1722. It was annexed by Chile in the late 19th century, and now maintains an economy based largely on tourism. Easter Island's most dramatic claim to fame is an array of almost 900 giant stone figures that date back many centuries. The statues reveal their creators to be master craftsmen and engineers, and are distinctive among other stone sculptures found in Polynesian cultures. There has been much speculation about the exact purpose of the statues, the role they played in the ancient civilization of Easter Island, and the way they may have been constructed and transported. Early Settlement The first human inhabitants of Rapa Nui, the Polynesian name for Easter Island, its Spanish name is Isla de Pascua, are believed to have arrived in an organized party of emigrants around 300 to 400 AD. Tradition holds that the first king of Rapa Nui was Hodo Machua, a ruler from a Polynesian subgroup, possibly from the Marquesa Islands, whose ship traveled thousands of miles before landing at Anakana, one of the few sandy beaches on the island's rocky coast. Did you know? After the decline of the Moai culture, a new cult of bird worship developed on Easter Island. It was centered on a ceremonial village called Orongo, built on the rim of the crater of the Renokau volcano. The greatest evidence for the rich culture developed by the original settlers, of Rapa Nui and their descendants is the existence of nearly 900 giant stone statues, that have been found in diverse locations around the island. Averaging 13 feet, 4 meters, high, with a weight of 13 tons, these enormous stone busts, known as Moai were carved out of tough, the light, porous rock formed by consolidated volcanic ash, and placed atop ceremonial stone platforms called ahus. It is still unknown precisely why these statues were constructed in such numbers and on such a scale, or how they were moved around the island. Phases of Violent Culture Archaeological excavations of Easter Island reveal three distinct cultural phases, the early period, 700 to 850 AD, the middle period, 1050 to 1680, and the late period, post 1680. Between the early and middle periods, evidence has shown that many early statues were deliberately destroyed, and rebuilt as the larger and heavier Moai for which the island is most famous. During the middle period, a house also contained burial chambers, and the images portrayed by Moai are thought to have represented important figures that were deified after death. The biggest statue found dating to the middle period measures about 32 feet tall, and consists of a single block weighing about 82 tons, 74,500 kilograms. 
The late period of the island's civilization was characterized by civil wars, and general destruction, more statues were toppled, and many mata, or obsidian spare points, have been found dating to that period. Island tradition claims that around 1680, after peacefully coexisting for many years, one of the island's two main ethnic groups, known as the Short Ears, rebelled against the Long Ears, burning many of them to death on a pyre constructed along an ancient ditch at Poyike, on the island's far northeastern coast. Outsiders on Easter Island The first known European visitor to Easter Island was the Dutch explorer Jacob Ragavine, who arrived in 1722. The Dutch named the island Paisaland, Easter Island, to commemorate the day they arrived. In 1770, the Spanish Viceroy of Peru sent an expedition to the island, the explorers spent four days ashore and estimated a native population of some 3,000 people. Just four years later, the British navigator Sir James Cook arrived, to find Easter Island's population decimated, by what seemed to have been a civil war, with only 600 to 700 men, and fewer than 30 women remaining. A French navigator, Jean-Francois de Gallop, Comte de la Perouse, found 2,000 people on the island when he arrived in 1786. A major slave raid from Peru in 1862, followed by epidemics of smallpox, reduced the population to only 111 people by 1877. By that time, Catholic missionaries had settled on Easter Island, and begun to convert the population to Christianity, a process that was completed by the late 19th century. In 1888, Chile annexed Easter Island, leasing much of the land for sheep raising. The Chilean government appointed a civilian governor for Easter Island in 1965, and the island's residents became full Chilean citizens. Easter Island today. An isolated triangle measuring 14 miles long by 7 miles wide, Easter Island was formed by a series of volcanic eruptions. In addition to its hilly terrain, the island contains many subterranean caves with corridors, that extend deep into mountains of volcanic rock. The island's largest volcano is known as Renocal, and its highest point is Mount Tiriamvaca, which reaches 1,969 feet 600 meters, above sea level. It has a subtropical climate, sunny and dry, and temperate weather. Easter Island boasts no natural harbor, but ships can anchor off Hangaroa on the west coast. It is the island's largest village, with a population of roughly 3,300. In 1995, UNESCO named Easter Island a World Heritage Site. It is now home to a mixed population, mostly of Polynesian ancestry, and made up of the descendants of the Long Ears and Short Ears. Spanish is generally spoken and the island has developed an economy largely based on tourism. <music>